Hello and welcome to my channel. Today I will be doing a follow-up video on my previous Gandalf the White video, which was a budget deck tech under $50. Today I will be doing an upgraded version of the deck, priced around $200, at power level 7, meant to be played as a casual table. I would like to start off this video by thanking you all for your feedback and your support on the previous video. I found it to be very inspiring. For those of you who are just here for the deck list, here you go. It will be on screen here, and if you want it, it will also be in the description of the video below. First, let's once again talk about our commander, Gandalf the White. Gandalf is a 3 colorless, 2 white, legendary avatar wizard. His stats are 4-5, and he has the ability Flash. You may cast legendary spells and artifact spells as though they had flash. This is very powerful because he serves as a shimmer mirror. Not only can you play him whenever you want to, but he lets you also play other artifacts and legendaries whenever you want to as well. However, the more powerful effect is Gandalf's second line of text. It reads, if a legendary permanent or an artifact entering or leaving the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. This is very powerful because it is both a panharmonicon and a Tesa Karlov effect for your artifacts and your legendaries. In this case, we are going to be focusing on the artifact side of this effect because we are playing an artifacts deck. First of all, let me give you a deck overview. Some things that you may need to know before you play this deck is this deck is a high power casual deck, meaning you will have no chance at competitive tables. This deck has a control and combo play style, so if you are more into aggro, this may not be the deck for you. And lastly, this deck is easy to pick up, but it is very hard to master. So if you like learning curves, then this may be the deck for you, but if you have a problem with it, then you may want to consider playing another deck. The next couple of things is to talk with your playgroup about. First of all, this deck uses an infinite combo as its primary win condition. While this may be not a problem for the majority of playgroups out there, there are certain playgroups that do have a problem with infinite combos to make sure you check with your playgroup ahead of time. Second of all, this deck is not a creature-based deck. Of course, there are creatures in the deck, and you can attack and block with your creatures. But the creatures are not the primary thing that will, you will be using in this deck. So if your playgroup has a problem with that, you need to know ahead of time. Lastly, this deck can occasionally break the con societal convention that each player will take a roughly equal amount of time on their turn. Due to Gandalf's effect, you will most likely be passing your turn instantaneously and playing your turn on somebody else's turn. So make sure that this is not a problem with your playgroup before you bring this deck to game night. Let's talk about the strengths and weaknesses of the deck. For a mono white deck, this deck has a high amount of card draw, interaction, and hard removal. Gandalf Letting you play cards at flash speed also makes the deck flexible and tricky to deal with. Because the deck is mono white, it has a very consistent mana base, and it is very hard to get mana screwed. And because of the combo nature of the deck, there is a high pop-off potential. Next, the weaknesses on the deck are also glaring. First of all, the deck is very reliant on its graveyard, meaning graveyard hate effects are really effective against it. The ramp that is available to you is also unreliable. The deck is also incredibly reliant on Gandalf the White, your commander, meaning if something were to happen to him, say he got imprisoned in the moon, or somebody took him from you, then your deck would fall apart. Being a mono white deck, you are also very slow to start the game, oftentimes passing your first three turns after playing just a land. And if you do not sequence properly, or you go overboard with your combo, you can very easily accidentally kill yourself. Here is a simple tutorial 
of how to play this deck. Step one, you ramp. Step two, you set up your value engine. Step three, you grind value against your opponents. Step four, you start controlling the game towards the later stages. And lastly, you combo off to finish the game and win for yourself. In terms of ramp, it is very simple. There are mana rocks in your deck like Soul Ring that produce mana. There are other ramp methods such as Archaeomancer's Map and Myriad Landscape to get additional basic lands onto the battlefield. For your value engines, they consist of cost discounters like Starnheim Corsair, Graveyard Recursion such as Junk Diver, and Sacrifice Outlets such as Trading Post. Your huge value cards to grind value against your opponents with include bombshells such as Angel of the Ruins that can be cycled for a land if you need to hit a land drop, or alternatively, it can come out and remove up to four artifacts or enchantments. The Might Stone and the Weak Stone serves as a double purpose, either removing important creatures that you need to get rid of, or drawing you tons of cards. And cards like Scrap Trawler really generate value and let you reuse your artifacts over and over again. This deck also have access to a myriad of cheap removal spells, such as Dispatch, ways to interact on the stack, such as Reprieve, and also ways to protect their own board state, like Teferi's Protection. Because I got a little bit of feedback, telling me that the combo demonstration was not too clear in the previous video, I would like to demonstrate the combo in a more clear way this time. Let's start with having Gandalf on the board. This is a given. We add up to three discounters of artifacts. In this case, let's say we have a Cloud Key, a Foundry Inspector, and a Starnheim Corsair on the battlefield. Next up, we need a consistent artifact sacrifice outlet. In this case, let's say we use an Arcbound Ravager. Lastly, we need two artifacts to Graveyard Recur themselves. In this case, we're going to be using a Workshop Assistant and a Junk Diver. To start off the combo, we are going to sacrifice the Junk Diver. What is going to happen is Arcbound Ravager will get a counter, the Junk Diver will enter the Graveyard, and two Junk Diver triggers will go onto the stack. Next, let's sacrifice the Workshop Assistant, holding priority to the Junk Diver triggers. The Workshop Assistant will go to the Graveyard, Arcbound Ravager will get another counter, and now there are two Workshop Assistant on the triggers on the stack as well. Let's resolve one of the Workshop Assistant triggers, and get Junk Diver back to our hand. Now, let's flash in Junk Diver, uh, because Gandalf allows us to do so. And we repeat step one of the loop by sacrificing the Junk Diver to the Arcbound Ravager. Now the Junk Diver is back in the graveyard and there are two more Junk Diver triggers on the stack. Now we do the same process but in reverse, this time getting Workshop Assistant back to our hand and then flashing it in and sacrificing it. You have now demonstrated a loop to your opponents that you can get an infinite number of Junk Diver and Workshop Assistant assistant triggers on the stack. While this is good enough on its own because this lets your Arcbound Ravager become an infinite infinite artifact creature that still has modular, so you can sacrifice the Arcbound Ravager to itself to distribute that modular trigger uh, and make all of your artifact creatures infinitely large, there are ways more direct that you can win the game immediately with. First of all, because of your discounts, you can use the infinite workshop assistant and junk diver triggers and another card that draws cards when it enters the battlefield to draw your entire deck. Once you have your entire deck in your hand, you can use a card like Soul Ring to produce an infinite amount of mana with once again the infinite number of workshop assistant and junk diver triggers on the stack. Lastly, you can sink your infinite mana into a walking ballista and finish off your opponents. Let's talk about some noteworthy interactions that there are in the deck. First of all, Moonsilver Key can search for Quark Clan Ironworks because the ability that Quark Clan Ironworks has is a mana ability. Second, 
Scrapyard Recombiner is a very powerful card in your deck because it lets you tutor for the most important cards. Surprisingly, some of the most important cards, such as Scrap Trawler, Foundry Inspector, and Walking Ballista are all constructs, so do not sleep on Scrapyard Recombiner at all. Open the Vaults normally is a very risky play, because not only do you get your artifacts back, but your opponents get to return their artifacts and enchantments to the battlefield as well. However, if you exile their graveyards with a Soul Guide Lantern before you play Open the Vaults, it turns into a very powerful one-sided bombshell. Scrap Trawler triggers whenever any artifact is put into the graveyard. This is very powerful when you have artifacts such as Elsewhere Flask that can sacrifice themselves. Gandalf the White doubles up imprint triggers. While this is obviously useful with Duplicant, you can also use this to double up the imprint trigger of a Semblance Anvil. So you can discount several types of cards by imprinting both an instant or and an artifact creature, for example, underneath the Semblance Anvil. I would like to say as well, this deck can be even stronger than it is. If you include fast mana, like Mana Crypt, powerful mono white stacks pieces, in this case, Ether Sworn Canonist, which is just absolutely disgusting, or powerful colorless bombshells, such as the One Ring, you can make the deck even more powerful than it is. The reason that I do not include these cards is because I would like my deck to stay within the power level of the playgroups of my local game store, meaning that the version that I'm showing you is a power level 7. If you push this deck to its limits, it might even be CEDH viable. Cards like Boromir, Warden of the Tower, can stop your opponents from cheating out zero mana spells. Mishra's Workshop, hilariously expensive, I think it's about almost $8,000 now, but this would be the single best deck to ever use this land. And a card like Phyrexian Revoker, which Gandalf allows you to play at instant speed, can shut down your opponent's infinite combo. I talked about some deck building pitfalls in my previous video, and I would like to do the same here. First of all, a card like Farewell is obviously very powerful. However, remember that you need to use your graveyard, and you need to have your artifacts be in your graveyard. So maybe exiling graveyards and exiling creatures is not a good idea. A card like Mother of Runes is great to protect your own cards with. However, you do need to remember that there are a limited number of cards that you can put into your deck. And, unfortunately, Gandalf does not let you flash in Mother of Runes at instant speed, meaning the card becomes very awkward if you top deck it in the late game. Lastly, cards such as March of Otherworldly Light, another example can be Solitude, are normally excellent in a mono white deck. However, due to the high amount of colorless cards in your deck, you may find yourself commonly in situations where you do not have a single other white card in your hand that you are willing to give up. So, cards such as March of Otherworldly Light, you should use them sparingly, if at all putting them into your deck. I would like to thank you once again for watching this video. If you liked the video, consider leaving a like. And if you want to see more deck techs in the future, consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.